Welcome to the Baltic University and welcome to Tallinn. In our series on the Baltic Sea environment, we will today discuss the future of our seas and perhaps even more so the future of our societies. And we will do this with a group here in Tallinn as well as with a group in Blekede in Germany because we have uh, a space bridge, a bridge, a satellite bridge over to Blekede in Germany and we will try to see if this bridge is working. We should have Per Arne Lindström in Blekede there somewhere. Per Arne, can you hear me? I can hear you, Lars. Ah. I can hear in Blekede. I can hear you. Very nice. Well, uh, now, since this is a live broadcast, I can tell you that we have very bad weather here. And what, the, what is it like over there? Oh, we are inside. It doesn't matter what's weather now. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I can tell you uh, it's a little bit dark now, and uh, we had some rain today. What do we get here? Rain sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Very good. I tell you who we are over here. It's uh, a group of students from actually five countries. First of all, the Estonian group, which comes from Tallinn Technical University here, of course, and then the Pedagogical University in Tallinn, and also Tartu University. Uh, uh, few um, kilometers east of here. Um, and then there is a group from two of the universities in St. Petersburg, and there is a Finnish group from Turku, Obo Academy. There is also a group from Uppsala in Sweden, and two Latvian groups, one from Riga and one from Daugavpils. And in addition to all these students, we also have uh, a group of experts and researchers and teachers from all these universities and from Tallinn. So we are very well uh, prepared to answer all kinds of questions and go into debate with whoever you will start talking over there. Back to you, Peronem. Yeah, we want to start with with Amelot. Good evening from Pekinet. Pekinet is a small town in the near of Hamburg. And here we have the Elfanaus, the department of the University of Pekinet. The possibilities of uh, telecommunication are fascinating. But my problem is, uh, should we use them as a game because it is possible, because we have fun, or should we use them uh, because we could help a bit to save the sea? I hope we will use them uh, in the second time. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Rita. I'm one of the students here from the University of Lüneburg. And we have also some guests here. From Poland, we have from the Agricultural University of Poland, some students. Mm -hmm. There on my right side, there are also um, some Stettin from State University and University of Stettin. And from the University of Dan. Well, Perone, before you go into that, we will uh, let um, the vice rector of um, Tallinn, uh, Tallinn Technical University say a few words of welcome. Please, it's uh, Professor Tanner. Thank you. There are participants of Baltic University on the topics of Baltic Sea environment on the both sides of the space bridge. It is my pleasure to welcome you, dear colleagues, dear students, on the both sides of this bridge. I wish you a fruitful work and active work in this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there is one more event that we cannot avoid to touch on. And as you all know, we were reached a few weeks ago by the 
terrible news of the MS Estonia disaster. Um, the ferry between Tallinn and Stockholm went to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and about 900 people lost their lives in this event. Among them were several friends, colleagues and relatives of ours. For example, here in the Tallinn Technical University, there were six students and two teachers. There were also several from Uppsala University, from the Pedagogical University and Tartu University. We will start by um, paying honor to their memory by lighting candles. And as lighting these candles, we will think that this space bridge should be only one of many bridges to be built in the future between Tallinn, Estonia and the surrounding countries. And we will see that this will happen. So now, being in Tallinn, we should start by having a look at what Tallinn looks like, the old city of Tallinn, and um, you know, it's an old Hansastadt, exactly like uh, the situation is down in uh, Blekid and Lüneburg. So let's have a few uh, glimpses from Tallinn. and professor at the university, what do we see? Yes, uh, I was born in Tallinn in uh, 1936. Mm. Uh, I think I know quite well our old town. You, you saw uh, different defense towers um, uh, from uh, the sea um, where starts our long street and now you have a look on our town square and town hall uh, from the 15th century with uh, Christmas tree and people walking around. This is a long uh, Hermann Tower with our blue, black and white flag. Uh, and here is already a new district, uh, Mustama, where is situated our Tallinn Technical University. Mm -hmm. This is the main building. Yeah, this is the entrance. We are actually in the room right to the right when you, when you enter this door here. So that's where we are. So now you know where we are. And of course, we will very soon see a few glimpses from Blekied as well. But um, before that is being done, perhaps we should say, what is Tallinn Technical University? Is it a large university? Uh, yes, uh, it's quite large technical university. And uh, uh, even we uh, have a little bit uh, less students than we had in the 70s. But I, I think we are the largest university in Estonia yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have only technical subjects? You have, um, say, economy, I know that, but you might have more things. Uh, yes, technical mm. subjects and mm. chemistry yeah. and economy. Mm. Of course, yeah. the traditional university in Estonia is Tartu, has been around since 1630 and well, 32, yes. I guess, but Tallinn is perhaps a little younger. Of course, mm. much younger than yeah. Tartu University. So let's go down to uh, um, Blekjede and see what is happening over there, what it looks like there. The Elbow River, a ferry boat. You can go on this ferry in order to get to Blekjede. There are also streets, but we haven't filmed them. The East German border used to be right here. After Germany's unification, this border doesn't exist. Blekede is a small town with 8,500 inhabitants. You see these street lamps everywhere in Blekede. 
Placida's first houses were built in 1209. Beautiful houses. If you take this road heading north, you will get to the Baltic Sea. We found boulders, houses and ferry boats. The road heading north and beautiful street lamps. But we also found Blekeden nestling in this wonderful countryside by the river. A paradise for countless birds and a wonderful shade of blue. This is the castle of Blekede. It dates from 1271. This transmission comes via satellite from the castle ballroom and the postman's name is Herr Renner. Thank you Blekede for this introduction. Now we I think nobody here knew about Blackheader before this introduction, but anyhow, it's down there. Um, I will say a few words about how this session is going to be organized. We have four main topics. The first one is environmental education and environmental awareness, as well as personal involvement um, and responsibilities. Then we'll go into the situation of the Baltic Sea and perhaps also some other seas. Um, and also we will see how our societies, in particular the technologies we use in our societies, influence the environment and the seas. Then, of course, we will try to look into the future as much as we can to see what technologies would we like to develop for our future. Um, we will do this uh, with the background of not only the Baltic Sea, but also uh, other European seas. So let's start by looking at a uh, computer graphics on um, Europe seen from a water perspective. This is, uh, of course, um, a notion of the drainage area is something that is uh, very efficient in understanding that international cooperation is really necessary to do something about environmental uh, pollution in the seas. How we see the six major drainage areas of Europe here, and we can enumerate them. We start from the east with the Caspian Sea, which is actually is a, rather a lake than a sea, to be proper, uh, which uh, has its environmental problems for sure. Then we have the White Sea in the north, which is bordering to the Atlantic. Then we have the North Sea in the west, which is also bordering to the Atlantic, but it's not the Atlantic, it's much more shallow. Um, then again we come into the Mediterranean Sea in the uh, south with a fairly small drainage area, if you don't count the Nile of course, all of that. So the uh, Mediterranean is very salty. And then the Black Sea drainage area, the largest drainage area in Europe with the Danube River. And finally we come into the Baltic Sea, our own sea here. And as you see it now, it's uh, all the rivers that's floating into uh, the sea from this drainage area. Uh, well, of course, the situation is special here because Germany, uh, different from Sweden and Estonia, um, Germany is um, part of several drainage areas, I believe three drainage areas. So how do you handle that down there in Germany? Over to Blackheda. Yes, we are sitting here in the North Sea drainage area. And uh, I want to uh, talk to Sigrid Niedermeyer now. She traveled all the way from Paris to come to us. <coughs> and uh, she's working for UNESCO. Can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about your work in this drainage areas and all around the world. Thank you, Per Arne. I would like to say a few words on our project, the UNESCO Associated Schools Project, which is a network of schools throughout the world promoting education for international understanding and international cooperation. 
in order to prepare young people and children to face the pressing challenges of humanity today. UNESCO associated schools now exist all over the world on all continents in 120 countries and there are 3,000 schools in all. Uh, they range from kindergarten through all school levels up to the universe to let's say teachers training institutions. These schools participate in pilot projects such as environmental pilot projects and they act as laboratories, you see, where new teaching methods are tried out, new teaching material is made, and uh, the students participating in the associated schools are offered the opportunity to learn more about the main problems in the world today. Uh, they learn about how they can take on personal responsibility and collective responsibility, and how they can think of, actively think of solutions, and at the same time, they help raise awareness in their community. Unfortunately, today there still often is a gap what is taught in the classrooms and uh, the reality out in the world. So we try to bridge this gap, to bridge this difference, and we try to uh, help this urgent need for new educational material for new educational teaching methods. Can Young you say, people... Can yeah. you say some words about the, your work in the different regions of Europe? Of Europe. Would be very good. Mm, maybe uh, I should tell you that we have an international project, and one of them is a Baltic Seed project on the school level. Now you work on the university level, the Baltic University, and we try to involve uh, students, school children of all ages to take part in this international Baltic Sea project where nine countries all around the Baltic Sea participate. And I have a student sitting beside me, Wipke, who comes from Germany, and she will tell you more about this project. But before I hand over the microphone to her, let me just add that this Baltic Sea project on the school level has been so successful that other projects, uh, not only in Europe but in the world, have been initiated after the Baltic Sea Project. And one of them is the Mediterranean Sea Project, with schools all around the Mediterranean. You know there are 20 countries, it's a big project. It's coordinated by Spain and Greece. Then there's a project along the Danube, with all the 11 countries from the source to this Black Sea participating on a school level. There's a Caribbean Sea Project, and now in Africa there's planned a uh, Victoria Lake project. I also know you tried to build up a North Sea project, but it isn't, isn't very far, I think. Or That's true. Definitely. One of the problems is that uh, Great Britain is not part of UNESCO, so if Great Britain is missing, there's not much, many countries left in the North okay. Sea. But let, let's speak to Vipke now. You have something to say about that? Or I, I hand over what, the microphone to, to Vipke. Yes. I'm Wiebke Schnabel from the Robert Bosch Comprehensive School in Hildesheim and I participated at the Baltic Sea project for students and in that 200 schools all over the nine countries around the Baltic Sea. Um, the Baltic Sea project is not only an environmental project but it's an intercultural project. We um, visit each other, write letters and have some exchanges. The project is coordinated by, the, by Sweden, and we have a newsletter. Um, and a school catalog, which is big as a telephone book. And you can find all the addresses from the 200 schools and their activities in it. And we have a book called Water Quality. It's a learner's guide for the Baltic Sea project. And uh, in conclusion, I want to say that I participated at the last big Baltic Sea What's meeting in Karlskrona, Sweden, <laughs> in last September. And I met lots and lots of students from all the nine countries, and we spoke nine different languages. And so we have a little joke. We spoke English. That's Baltic English. That's why I'm speaking now. 
and mm -hmm. um, also we made an appeal to decision makers and politicians to save the Baltic Sea. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Perone. Yes, after this D2 around the world, we are, uh, came back through Europe to Blackgirder again. And uh, where is Blackgirder? We, I want to take a short look at the map. It's situated at the river Elbe. And I used to call it, call it the small Berlin, because <coughs> until a few years ago, it was divided and Elbe was a dividing water, a troubled water. And now Elbe is a united water again. Earlier we had the Iron Curtain here through this town. Uh, we are now going back to the Elbtal House. And yesterday we said together, as Britta said before, and worked together to try to manage this program. And it was very hard work. And uh, we should see a short uh, video from that. Yes, but. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, over there in uh, Blekjede. And of course, I guess you would like to know what's going on in this end. Um, we'll just give you a few glimpses from the northern end of the Baltic region. And we have actually one student here who is also a school teacher in an interesting school in eastern Latvia. Please. Okay. You, you are? My yeah. name is Iveta. I'm from Dolgopos Pedagogical University and from Ecosophical School at the same time. And uh, this year in Dogopus, uh, we started a new kind of school for us, so-called ecosophical school. It is uh, in Dogopus, it is primary school. It means for, it is for children from six to fourteen years. And it is uh, in this school, in this school program, the main stress is uh, put on the uh, human ecology, uh, which includes also the. Uh, environmental lessons uh, when uh, children go outside the city uh, just to observe maybe maybe to feel uh, to feel them uh, themselves the part of the nature and not only the user, users uh, of it and uh, there's also some lessons special lessons where the children work with the nature uh, products maybe with wood with uh, leaves or just with snow in winter or so something like that. Mm. Thank you, Evita. Is this what you're doing in the Elbtal house in uh, Blackyard? I know it's also some kind of nature house. How is it working? Yes, at yes. my side I have Celia Fisher and she can tell you a little about that. Yes, hello. My name is Celia. And I'm working in the Elbtal house. We saw the, so, uh, our action of the last two days and we prepared us. I think we are good prepared. And I'll tell you something about our house, our work. We're starting with this environmental center in this year. It's an institution of the University of Lüneburg and the city of Blegede. We are working in a very nice old house and we are building up an exhibition, an exhibition not like a normal museum. We want to try to get the people inside to our house to present them the nature and they can touch something in the exhibition 
and we include the persons and we want to show the threats of the River Elbe. The River Elbe is our main uh, project in this house and we also want to include the university, the students, lots of students are working there and we are hoping that we can help the River Elbe, uh, that it's not so polluted in the future and we are working for this. Well, thank, thank you. We uh, well, we are back here in uh, Tallinn, I think. So thank you very much. Are we? And, uh, and uh, I think one interesting continuation of this reasoning is what's happening at the pedagogical universities. And we also have uh, one student from, or rather two students from the pedagogical university in Dagapils. Uh, yesterday we discussed the situation with uh, environmental programs in different universities and we discovered that the situation is more or less the same. Uh, I mean, situation about uh, environmental studies. It, it means that uh, mostly uh, nature science students can take environmental courses. Uh, speaking about our university, primary teachers they also have uh, this environmental course. And uh, we have uh, a place for, for uh, summer practice for our biology students. But uh, other students can also use this place. And every autumn, they can come there to so-called autumn seminars. So how many students at your university would uh, go to this? Is it many of the teachers or a few of those becoming teachers? Uh, well, it's, it's not too many of them, but mostly those who are really interested mm -hmm. in it. So most teachers in Latvia do not receive environmental training, eh? Yes. Ah, it's right. too bad. What about Estonia? Because we have also a pedagogical university here in Tallinn. Would you say we have one of the teachers here? Please yeah. introduce yourself. Mm? Tina Arvista is my name. I am from Tallinn Pedagogical University. Uh, our teachers and uh, future three teachers have uh, training uh, in the nature every year. Mm -hmm. um, but our problem is uh, that um, nowadays uh, there aren't enough teachers in the schools. And the reason is um, uh, that um, salaries are extremely low. And uh, so uh, teachers uh, uh, go and look uh, for other professions, for example, they yeah. go in shops and in business. So the difficult economic situation will hit also the uh, um, educational system, yes, I understand. Yes, hard. Uh, what is the situation in Germany at your teacher's training? Do you have a good environmental backing for them? Yes, no, I think... Uh, First of all, one of our students has a question here, and <laughs> we will start with that. Uh, my name is Helgo, and I'm from the um, University of Lüneburg, and I'm taking part in teacher education there. Um, I heard just about your um, pilot project you're starting, or you're actually doing in Estonia, this um, primary school. Is there anything like, like this, what you're doing in your um, pilot project, is this um, in, in the curricula? I mean, is it something that is promoted by the state or is this, is this just an experiment? Well, thank you. Let, let's um, go to the um, teachers also in, uh, in the Tallinn Technical University and say what they say about environmental training. Do you think it's supported or not? This is Professor Harald Wellner, who is uh, head of that part of Tallinn Technical University, which after all is the largest university in Estonia. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question. We started many years ago in two faculties, in the Faculty of Chemistry and uh, Civil Engineering, but uh, with uh, environmental oriented uh, very special courses. But three years ago, a council of university decided that it's not enough. And now we have, for all students, a background environmental protection course uh, during the first or the second year of education. 
and uh, we have uh, ecology, hydrology, and uh, cleaner production approach, and uh, a new legislation. You know, it's very important for us, especially we are now running or going to the European community. So I think that uh, it's a good uh, step uh, forward, but uh, it's not uh, all. We have uh, special courses too in different branches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We will ask one of the students here. Um, you tell us your name and what's your question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, my name is uh, Maria. I study in Obo Academy in Finland. I don't have a question, but uh, I think it's very good for us to, to train and to um, educate young people and children. But I don't think we have time to, to wait until this generation uh, becomes adult and, and makes the good decisions. We have to educate ourselves and go to individuals and also try to educate the older generation and how we could do that, that, that could be the question. Mm -hmm. So, so what, is, uh, uh, what is your answer in this in Germany? How do you reach the general population? Well, what you say, somebody's coming up there, yeah. Well, hello, my name is Antje, yes, and I work in the Elftal House, and I think one just little stone in all this wall is what we are doing in the Elftal House, our exhibition, that we try to reach people who come as tourists, tourists to this region and also the people who live in town, that they can see in our exhibition what uh, nice nature things they have got around here, and they got also information on things that they can take home for their daily lives. And we think this is just one little part we can do here. Yes, it's really interesting to see that we have a lot of uh, simple questions. We can take the same questions and ask them at all levels, all age levels, and it doesn't matter how the people are educated before. One of these questions is, what do we need? And another question is, what can we do? So I think such simple questions, they are really important, because we can use them everywhere. And of course, uh, after a lot of studies, a lot of science, we have uh, other possibilities to answer such questions. And uh, I think that we shouldn't forget that UNESCO is having uh, many materials and perhaps you can say very short something about that Sigrid? Mm. I would first of all like to say that I think that the main problem is that people feel helpless and powerless. People do know that the Danube is black instead of blue and the, the Baltic Sea, I mean it's well known now how polluted it is, but it's this feeling of powerlessness, of not knowing what to do, that is the real problem. So I think that coming back to children and to young people, you those to who participate in projects are really lucky, you see, because they see they are uh, not alone with, with the anxiety about the future. They see that others are working at the same time. And by participating, by doing something actively, and by communicating with others who work too, you know, like we do today with the Space Bridge, we can see and break this circle of powerlessness. Okay, what do you say about well, this in yes, Tallinn? There, there are many thoughts yeah, about this, and of course we had one group yesterday that was discussing, and I will give first the word to one of the students here. Uh, well, you can take that microphone, yeah? Say yes. Who you are. Mm -hmm. I'm Eleanor from Uppsala University. Uh, I believe that it's very important that education comes down to all levels that we get it all in the society, not that it's just specialist people that have the knowledge. And uh, to, to make people know what to do with it, and uh, also that the communities now take this again, that 21 program seriously, and uh, show people that there is a way to, to go out and from this bad recycling. Uh, uh, to go forward for a sustainable society. So you say that uh, education, environmental education, would be necessary for developing sustainability. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think 
Professor Wellner has a comment on this. No, I'd like Please, only to say that the, yeah. in uh, our opinion, it's very important exchange of opinions and uh, knowledge between the universities. Yeah. For example, we have a good cooperation with the Turku University, Tampere, Stockholm University, and other. So it means that uh, it's not only oriented to our Estonian approaches. Mm. It's more larger. Mm. And now you have a committee on environmental education in Helcom, I know that. Oh, yeah, it Wendell is. And now is the chairman of Helcom, so we should uh, say something about that. Perhaps it's a successful committee, or what you say? It's uh, one of uh, very important committees. Uh, it's a committee for a public relation. And I am very happy to say that uh, Dr. Rudén is one of... Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the project leaders, the uh, most popular project leaders in the Helcom approach. Yeah. And this uh, Baltic University, it's important mm -hmm. for a uh, young. Well, thank, thank you. you. And then I have to say that I also know that this particular committee had quite difficulties to get finance from the governments. And do you think that this means that the governments don't think environmental education is, is so important? I think uh, they, they know that it's important, but business is more important for them, perhaps. Uh -huh. So what you say down in Germany, how do we handle this? The governments don't pay us, how do we handle it? We are very proud of you too, Lars. <laughs> Thank you. Though. But uh, we should come to this pre problem with the money too. But I think uh, at first we should take one small thing before that, because a very important role in this environmental education the NGOs are playing. And we have here uh, Wolfgang Günther. I want to give him the floor, and perhaps you can introduce yourself and say something about the NGOs and about CTB. Um, my name is Wolfgang Günther. I'm working for the uh, BUND, that's a Bund für Umwelt und Naturschutz Deutschland, uh, an NGO, environmental NGO in Germany. And uh, I'm a representative from, for the CCB, for the Coalition Clean Baltic as well. And um, the Coalition Clean Baltic is a network of um, environmental NGOs around the Baltic Sea. And uh, the is Coalition Clean Baltic um, Knows, uh, or, uh, is knowing that uh, environmental education is a most important uh, topic. And uh, so we are uh, um, participating in this um, uh, BITF working group and in the HELCOM framework on environmental education as well. And um, 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 so we, this problem we uh, um, already mentioned with the, with, the, with the lack of money is uh, a key problem um, on our, out of our point of view as well. Yes, all of us agree with that, that we have to make a big, a big change. We have to change our economy, we have to change a lot. We are going to speak a lot about that. But I think we have the wrong starting points. As an educator, I would like to say, and I know that many people here agree with me when I say that, we must have new starting points. So we, we must, must really build up something new. And perhaps we should try to, t to think about this start, starting point in the Western countries. Enough must be enough. Perhaps we should try to start with that. Well, well, thank you, Perone. Since I know you are very much involved in education and you have the uh, CCB and the UNESCO, etc., people down there, we, I'm sure you will return to environmental education uh, during the whole broadcast. But I think now we should have a look and see what is actually happening with the Baltic Sea. And I'll let one of the students from St. Petersburg come in. Please you say your name as well. Hello, my name is Alona. I'm from St. Petersburg State University and I'm studying geography. I would like to ask you a question. How can you characterize the ecological situation of the Baltic Sea today? Is it uh, catastrophical or not? Well, thank, thank you. you. Do you have uh, 
somebody down in Blackyede who are prepared to answer this? You have, I know you have some um, researchers on the Baltic Sea down there. Yes, then I may introduce Kai Ehrmeis to you. Can you say a few words about yourself at the beginning? Yes, my name is Kai Emais. I'm a scientist at the Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, which is near Rostock. I'm a marine geologist, and I'm part of this institute that is devoted to study the ecological situation in the Baltic Sea, and the institute collects expertise from biologists, physical oceanographers, chemists, and geologists. Actually, this institute is very interesting because it tries to look at the Baltic Sea over the disciplines, and it tries to integrate the different disciplines, which is necessary to see how the situation of the Baltic Sea is. And it may come to us as a surprise for many people that um, the Baltic Sea appears to be still a divided marine body. It is not as bad as many people may think because the Baltic Sea has had a very recent upsurge, for instance, of health. There was a big intrusion of new water coming into the Baltic Sea two years ago, and the entire Baltic Sea, as it used to be, is now oxic, as we call it. There is oxygen in the deep waters of the Baltic Sea almost everywhere. That does not mean that has anything to do with man. It has to do with a natural situation. And it means also that it's likely to change again. But it was a relief to many people involved in science that not only did the environmental situation change, but also the political scientific um, situation changed because there was a big push towards international science in the Baltic Sea. And in recent months, there have been several conferences where researchers of the entire Baltic environment came together and decided on what they want to do for the next 10 years in terms of research. And this was for the first time ever, I believe, that apart from Helcom activities, which go back in to the 70s, that there was a concerted effort which will be taken up by the environmental agencies of the EC, which decided to fund an international program of three years research by a targeted project in the Baltic Sea. So research is actually doing the same thing that education has obviously done for the last years. It's grouping resources and it's focusing the diverse resources of the different countries of the Baltic Sea to study this very in international sea. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kai Emais, and we will have one of the uh, very experienced Baltic Sea researchers up here also say a few words. And this is uh, Professor Astok uh, from Tallinn Technical University, please. <coughs> thank you. My mm -hmm. very short uh, opinion about environmental education. Mm -hmm. If we take it from the point of, of money, there must be very correctly how many money we will give to education, how many to real um, processes for protection of the sea, or how many for research. So that can be formed as question, what is better? The very good educated, environmentally educated children and grandchildren mm -hmm. without <laughs> clear sea. Mm -hmm or clear Z and not so good educated children and grandchildren. Well, that's... <laughs> I, I don't know if it's possible to make such a distinction. I'm, let's uh, uh, see the people down in Germany what they say about this at the Black Gede. Where, where do you want to put your efforts on education, research or investments? One of the students had a, has a comment on that. I think it's, um, it's a question of changing um, people's mind about nature. And um, if you always cure the symptoms, you won't change anything. So you have to start teaching the people that they are a part of nature and that they are responsible for their environment. As long as people don't feel responsible and don't act responsibly, 
you just can help or t uh, try to clean the, the North Sea and the Baltic Sea and you, d you have to do it ever again because nobody's going, going to feel responsible and going to feel like um, it's my thing to do it. So I, I have to start, not somebody else. Yeah, so in this question, we um, should uh, take perhaps this way. We used to ask um, how should we create human rights, and we have them, but perhaps we should have also some sort of human obligations. What do you think about that? Well, uh, that is for everybody to think about. I understand that your approach was that the long-term solution needs education as the most important investment. Well, what about the short-term situation? What is your opinion on the Baltic Sea today? Is it as light as uh, Kayemais was? Um, it seems to me that maybe it's different in different countries, but um, in our economical situation, it seems to me that the, that the first position must be investments. And of course, there must be optimal this result, mm -hmm. but how to found it, I don't know. So for Estonia, investment is first priority. For Germany, education is first priority, perhaps. perhaps. Okay, well, countries are different, of course. Now, there, are you happy with the answer, Lona? Well, <laughs> you know, we'll go to one of the other um, people in your group. Natasha, where is she? Yeah, they, she had this very interesting idea about um, how to find out the situation, how the situation is about the Baltic Sea. Please. My name is Natasha. I am from St. Petersburg University. Ecology problems cannot be detected without chemical or biological monitoring. It is known that plants are very sensitive indicated of environmental conditions. Uh, would, um, I would like uh, to ask uh, maybe uh, somebody uses uh, the methods of bioindication uh, for monitoring of environment, environmental uh, in general and particularly in monitoring of uh, big cities around Baltic Sea. Thank you. And of course, the situation is that Natasha comes from Petersburg, that is the largest city, about 5 million inhabitants. And it's a terrible polluter, I can say. Nothing negative about Russia or Petersburg, but I think it's polluting terribly. And uh, of course, how to find out about this? What are the bioindicators? Let's ask some of the biologists. I think you have a couple of biologists that might be, uh, have some interesting to say about this down in Blackheden. Lars, I think first of all we have a student, Thomas, he worked on that, I think, or he knows something about it. Please, Thomas, may you <laughs> introduce yourself and say something? Yeah. <clears throat> My name is uh, Tomasz. Uh, I came from Poznań, from uh, uh, Agricultural University. Uh, Poznań is uh, not so big uh, city like uh, Petersburg, <laughs> but um, there is uh, another problem of money. Um, Everybody knows that uh, eutrophication uh, caused by nitrate and phosphate uh, pollutions is a major problem of Baltic Sea. We would like to know if it's a good idea to place uh, a fine on this pollution. Perhaps it would be sensible to make the fine dependent upon percentage of emission of this uh, nutrients. Do you believe that introduction of uh, such a fine would help reduce uh, eutrophication? Yes, back to Tallinn again. Yes, this was more uh, environmental policy question, what to do about it, out of economic sanctions for those who pollute more. Well, let's, let's ask Professor Wellner then, who is uh, well um, 
informed about the HELCOM approach. Is this something that's being done in the Baltic Sea region that polluters are um, taxed or uh, punished through uh, economic sanctions in some way? Yeah, we try to do it, but uh, I can say it's not very easy. It depends uh, by state by state. We have no one approach in the Baltic Sea area, yeah. but uh, it it works partly with taxes. We we try to give more strong standards for emissions, especially phosphorus and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is uh, how how uh, strong they should be. You know, for example, for nitrogen, it depends from the possibilities of the mm -hmm. uh, countries. And for example, for Sweden, perhaps uh, it could be eight uh, milligram per liter. But for Estonia, it's uh, practically not possible to have uh, less than 16. So it depends. Mm -hmm. But uh, we try to give uh, mm, common standards and, and, uh, and taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, there has been a, a policy in HELCOM that the uh, nitrogen inflow to the Baltic Sea, and I think also the phosphorus, should be halved by 1995. Isn't that so? Yeah, it's uh, just a few days left. How will that uh, be handled? You know, you uh, I, I have to be very open and say that uh, it was six years ago when uh, the ministers decided that uh, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and other half harmful substances should be diminished to 50 percent. But it was, I think, more political decision. There was no economical background behind. Mm. And now we are thinking what happens, what is in a reality. Mm. And I am not quite sure that uh, today it is possible to have a 50 percent reduction. But mm. in some cases, in some countries, mm. it is so. For example, in Sweden, in Finland, uh, in the more richest countries, but not in the uh, eastern of the uh, uh, Baltic Sea. Don't you think we should turn this question back to uh, the students from Poland? Because uh, I think the Polish agriculture is producing a lot of nitrogen. Isn't that true? Ah, it is sure. Yeah. It's a very good question <laughs> for well, Poland. Go back to Poland and see what they say. Okay, Polish students. <laughs> Want to ask for this question? I'm not an expert, <laughs> uh, but I think um, some countries used uh, um, more fertilizers, some uh, some used less fertilizers, and uh, um, it may be uh, some way. Uh, I'm not expert. <laughs> Here is I think. It's when we try it with. Okay, good. Um, my name is Przemek, I am from University of Szczecin and uh, situation with agriculture and um, outlet of nitrogen and uh, phosphorus to the uh, Baltic Sea, which origin uh, are, is uh, agriculture, looks uh, for now a little different in Poland because our uh, financial condition uh, are such uh, low that mostly farmer uh, farmers uh, have enough money for uh, put fertilizer in uh, um, big scale, let's say. Uh, so uh, if we compare amount of, of uh, phosphorus which is transport to the Baltic Sea through the rivers and so and so and so on, uh, we can we can compare uh, five about five uh, five thousand tons phosphorus are originate from. Uh, agriculture, but uh, about 30 and uh, 5,000 ton originated from from sewage water. So I think that for now the bigger bigger problem for for the uh, biogen uh, bi biogen's uh, outlets is is the sewage water. Thank you. Yes, maybe I can make a statement on the nitrogen and phosphorus question, which is a very important question in the Baltic Sea. Obviously, plant nutrients, I can, you know, this is answering the question that was posed uh, on the other end of the space bridge. Obviously, there are, pla there are indicator plant species that can tell us about the status of the environment in which they grow 
I don't know much about land plants. I can tell you something about marine plants. These are tiny little plants, unicellular plants, diatoms. And we see in sediment cores and we see in time series of sampling the waters that there is always a change in the species composition. So yes, there are indicator species that can tell us something about the status of the environment. And we can see, for instance, a very large change in the environment that occurred. But, but let's can, say, can you tell us also uh, how it look, what it looked like when you compare uh, the Baltic Sea with the North Sea and with the Black Sea? You right. Know, I think you know a lot about that too. But yes, very Baltic, short. I mean, obviously, these um, these indicators of pollution, let's say, or of nutrient export are the same as you go to the different marginal seas, as we call them, as compared to the ocean. For instance, another marginal sea is the North Sea or the Black Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. And all these marginal seas are surrounded by a lot of people. And all these people develop their industries and they put most of their sewage into the seas. And all of the problems that we see in the Baltic Sea are the same in the Mediterranean, and especially in the Black Sea, which is very similar in terms of a circulation system. In the Black Sea, there is a big input of nutrients by the rivers. At the same time, there is less fresh water coming in, as it is in the Baltic Sea. And so the environment changes very drastically. An interesting aspect to the nitrogen and phosphorus is that there is a decision, a political decision, and now the scientific discussion has been rekindled if it is actually a good idea to reduce the amount of phosphate and nitrogen. Thank you. And we had one student wanted to say something about that. Hello, my name is Piotr. I'm from Poland, from Gdańsk University. And uh, we sort of skip a schedule a little because we started sort of uh, five discussion, discussions in one time mm -hmm. and I, want to, I wanted to finish one. That was that. Uh, <laughs> someone mentioned uh, three things uh, which was research, uh, hi, uh, research, <laughs> investment and education and uh, where, to, where, to, where, where to put the money. So uh, the, the final conclusion was that Germany put the money to education and uh, uh, people in Tallinn says that they want to put the money to invest, uh, well, in some uh, devices, investment, just straight, uh, ecological. Yeah. You want to Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, I'm finishing. Okay. Yeah, and, um, but nobody mentioned research. And I think, I, I know that there is a lot of uh, research, uh, common uh, research uh, starting with Sweden and Poland. And, uh, but, uh, I, I mean, it could be a question to the students in Tallinn. What do you think? Is, is it uh, more important to analyze uh, as a Baltic Sea? Uh, while we already know it is polluted in, well, and we have a lot of data, uh, or it's better to invest, it, invest this money to, uh, uh, to certain wastewater devices uh, whatsoever? Thank you. I know where the money do we, is. Do we come back to uh, Tallinn? Yes. Of course, it's, uh, we could continue this discussion for the whole period of two hours, but we will not do that. I'll just remind you that uh, the investment costs and the research costs are on different scales. So they could go on at the same time in a way. But we have one more student here who will add on to this discussion about changes of the environment, changes of species, and uh, indicate the species. Please. My name is Chris, and I come from Obo Academy in Turku, Finland. I'd like to ask about new species, introduction of species in the Baltic, according to the situation in the Black Sea, where introduced species have caused a lot of problems. I would like to know what efforts has been made to prevent introduction of foreign species to the Baltic, and then on the contrary, what efforts has been made to preserve original Baltic species, like the Baltic salmon, for example. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Dr. Ojaver from the Marine Research Institute here in Tallinn, who is so well ex experienced with this. And of course, we have questions about environmental changes and perhaps accidentally introduced species or lost species. Well, thank you. Uh, that is a very uh, 
important question because of uh, in recent years, especially, we, we are having uh, new species in the Baltic Sea, not only uh, fish species, uh, but especially um, phytoplankton and zooplankton species. Uh, we cannot avoid them to invade the Baltic Sea because of we are simply uh, not in the position. But we can investigate what is their importance and whether they have become a member of a food web in the Baltic Sea or not. And we investigated a bit in this uh, summer season a new species that was a Cladocerian species invaded to the Baltic Sea from the Caspian Basin and that was... What, what kind of animal or plant was this? Uh, that was, uh, that is a uh, uh, small animal hardly seen by eye and uh, that is uh, well say one or two millimeters long and uh, to my great surprise, that was very actively used by herring as food animal. Mm. And as herring is very lean now, then especially Cercopagis pengue, that was the new species, that is the Latin name, uh, it constituted quite an important part of uh, uh, Gulf Africa herring diet in summer period. Mm -hmm. Well, that is one side of the question. Of course, another side is to prevent the Baltic ecosystem from harmful invaders. And uh, of course, that is, that is regulated too, and even that is regulated as far as I know by HELCOM and, and other scientific bodies. Uh, but still, yeah, as I told already, we are not in the position to prevent everything. That is mainly uh, climate change that has brought us the new species. So would you say that uh, the first uh, species you mentioned was a good introduction? Well, yes, that, uh, that seems to be good. But uh, we haven't had very long experience with that uh, new species yet. Mm -hmm. And um, furthermore, we have quite a lot of other species. They, they are new species too. Mm -hmm. They are from phytoplankton species and uh, as I told, uh, uh, one fish species is in the southern Baltic new. But Another side is we yeah, have... Yes, this question, is it caused by the eutrophication? Uh, this, uh, well, new? that seems to be caused uh, maybe by eutrophication, but mainly by climate uh, fluctuation. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, that species is uh, fresh water or uh, of very fresh uh, as compared with marine water of very fresh, mm, well, uh, water, say, that is, uh, yes, from Caspian Basin. Mm -hmm. But another question and another side of the question is uh, we have lost uh, uh, quite a number of species or quite a number of species have uh, dropped into depression now. That is another side of the question and maybe uh, somebody will comment on that. Let's, um, let's ask the people in Germany, do you have a similar situation with the introduction of new species, good or bad, in, do you know th something about the North Sea or the Black Sea or the Mediterranean? Well, where is Germany? Are you lost? <laughs> Out in space uh, somewhere? Uh, hello. Yes, I don't know about introduction of new species into the Mediterranean or the Black Sea, but I know that there is a lot of new species coming into the Baltic Sea on an almost regular basis because they are transported by the weight water of ships and they are being flushed out in the Baltic Sea and if the environment is suitable they will grow here and they will be more or less introduced into the ecosystem and that happens on a very regular level and it has happened in the past as well 
and I believe that is part of a it's not necessarily due to eutrophication but it's just a way that life spreads on earth whenever they find a niche they go there and live Well, this again, this is a rather optimistic view of it, and of course it's working with this particular species that is a good food for the herring, I guess. But perhaps uh, I think there are other species, for example, in the Black Sea, who has been very detrimental. Uh, but there is also one question about the cod here. We had one of our students from Petersburg. Oh, please. My name is Masha. I'm from St. Petersburg State University. I'm studying geography and ecology. I would like to ask a question to specialist for um, of fish. Uh, we are snow uh, from television save the sea. Uh, there is a, a problem near the Sweden coast. Uh, the co code is disappeared. Disappear. And uh, my uh, question, uh, what is the main reason of this uh, situation? Uh, from your point of view, uh, the first, the overfishing, the second, pollution and human activity, and uh, the third, nature pro process, and uh, something else. Well, thank, thank, thank you, Maria. Uh, I think we uh, have to go back to our health comm experts over here. I say what they say before we leave the uh, word over to uh, Germany. But perhaps, Professor Wellner, would you say something about this? Thank you. Uh, I, I yeah. think Dr. Euler, he is a big expert in um, this kind. Okay. He can answer uh, us. Please. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, that is, I think that all these named uh, reasons have their role in that question. And uh, mm. of course, we can accuse uh, uh, people that they uh, done uh, quite uh, harmful things for the Baltic ecosystem, but still uh, we cannot uh, have even equal influence to natural changes and periodic fluctuations of climate in the Baltic Sea, and that uh, is connected with uh, periodic influxes or or loss uh, or um, uh, stagnations in the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. And of course, over exploitation has played its role, and uh, cod spawning stock has therefore uh, reduced to uh, record low uh, strength. Eutrophication mm -hmm. has played its role, but the main reason is natural uh, changes, and that is climate changes. Yeah, so now, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. we cannot forget that the biggest fluxes from the North Sea to the Baltic happens, uh, I remember, 18 years ago, and uh, the last year was the second. That so was uh, in the end of the 70s, uh, the last well, it was 76, uh, I think. Yes, was uh, that was the last uh, major mm -hmm. influx into the Baltic mm -hmm. Sea. Mm -hmm. And the newest was 1993. Yes. So that, that was about 16 years. We well, had no Professor Van, would you say that, uh, would you say that it's good for the Baltic Sea to have this eutrophication, as uh, Kayema said in, in, uh, in Blekjede? I am not sure. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's not a good thing, but yeah. uh, for a fishery, perhaps I don't know, or fishermen, they like to have a food for fishes. Yeah. But uh, for a future of the Baltic Sea, it's nonsense. So yeah. we don't like to have the eutrophication. No, no, it's not like very much up here. You know, we we, I think we should touch upon one other um, subjects that we have been discussed up here, and this is something that I think we all could agree that is not very good, and it's pollution from industry and military. And we'll uh, have two students here who have prepared that. My name is Jill, and I'm from Sussex University on the south coast of England. This is Andrew, and we are studying the Baltic 
environment through the Uppsala University in Sweden. We have two questions which we'd like to address to Helcom. The first one is this. Yes, we would like to know if Helcom thinks that the hotspots identified around the Baltic states should be categorized under specific headings, such as industrial, military, and municipal, to give a clear indication of where the problems lie and who should be responsible for finance. Well, this was quite a big question. Who, who are looking into this, uh, the hotspots? And I know some of the hotspots are military hotspots. And of course, here in uh, Estonia, there has been a recent evaluation of the cost for cleaning this up. And we have uh, over here, we have uh, Mr. Lee from the Minister of Environment in Estonia. And you might comment on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a microphone, I believe. You have one from Andrew over there. Uh, yeah. I would like to say that, of course, uh, we have no more information about military pollutions here around politics and especially in Estonia as well. But, uh, of course, today we know that uh, concerning hotspots, we cannot say so directly that we would like to deliver the hotspots, military hotspots and um, uh, so-called industrial or others. Because uh, still today the main problem we have with uh, our industry and, of course, in some scale also agriculture like uh, non-point pollution problems in such a way in those hotspots are or were delivered uh, were divided mm -hmm. so uh, in some cases we can say only that yes uh, we have certain influence or potential influence from military uh, sources or so-called uh, through previous Soviet military uh, units that's the uh, case of uh, Paldiski and uh, Silama. But uh, other sites are quite far from, uh, uh, from uh, our sea, so, so we cannot say so directly. Mm. Of course, there are certain influences. But you want to clean them up, of wherever course. they are. Of course. Who is going to pay it? Uh, according to... That's Andrew's question. Eh? Uh, mm? That is uh, eh? now our responsibility. Because as you know, there's uh, no possibilities to get the funds for direct cleanups uh, through from Russian side. But uh, there is, of course, uh, possibility to use uh, different international funds as well. But uh, mainly, that's our responsibility, and we are. So it's Estonian national thing to pay all this. How much do you think it will be? Uh, the another question is how long that will be and how yeah. much we can uh, pay for that because, uh, mm. of course, that is also clear that uh, we can cover only quite a small part of very dangerous pollution problems. And the rest of uh, problems obviously will be uh, in natural situation and uh, that means that uh, we are looking for certain funds for that but we cannot answer today how long that will last or, or how big the money or funds should be for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the situation in Germany? Do you also have uh, military point sources or hotspots that they have been phrased by uh, the Helcom group? And As who I is paying for that? Give the floor at once to the students. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, my name is Elke Jonsson and I come from Sweden, but I study here in Lüneburg. And I want to ask you some questions about the problems um, of the pollution left by the Ru Russian army. And my question is, um, who is responsible for that? And um, um, uh, what are the pollutions? Uh, are you really sure that you know that uh, there is no such pollutions like nuclear uh, things and yeah, stuff like that. And, um, <clears throat> and what has been done until now? That's some of my questions. Yes, Tallinn. 
We give you the floor very short. You must answer very short, and then another student wants to put a question to that, too. Okay, uh, we have uh, two things to put in here. And one, which I think we should do before we come to your student, is to let the Latvians um, have something to say. And they did not send uh, an expert to speak on this, but they did make a, a small film. So I think this is a proper time to see what the Latvians think about this, the uh, uh, military point uh, sources of pollution to the Baltic Sea. And I hope you are able to show this now. Liepāja was the first city in Latvia affected by the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Already in October 1939, a garrison of the Red Army was formed there. After the Second World War, Liepāja port became one of the most important military ports in the west of the Soviet Empire. About 20,000 newcomers, mainly military personnel, settled in the territory of the military port which occupies nearly one-third of the city territory. This led to a rapid decrease of the percentage of Latvians in Liepāja, from 85% during the Second World War to less than 50% at the end of 60s. Due to military interests, cargo port was closed in 1967 and Liepāja became a closed city. Since then, a pass regime has been introduced in the northern part of the city. According to Latvian-Russian treaties, a ceremony was held on the 1st of June 1994 on occasion of the last Russian ships leaving the port. But the inheritance left by the occupation regime has resulted both in ecological and social problems. Burnt and demolished houses Canal waters full of oil, murders, violence. This is now the everyday life of the army port. Approximately 80% of the former military buildings can't be used. Multi-flat houses are half empty and plundered. Heating is almost impossible in winter. The former well-equipped naval school of radio communication is plundered as well. The Army Port Canal is the most polluted part of the port. Totally more than 30 ships and submarines are sunken in it. The pollution caused by different oil products and chemicals found in the ships affects both the port equatory and the quality of water in the Baltic Sea. Probably the main cause of sinking of these ships is the recent non-ferrous metal fever. During recent years, only some of the objects in the port territory were guarded, so the hunters of non-ferrous metals could take away all the copper, zinc and bronze parts. The unnecessary cable covers were burnt in landing places. On the bank of the port canal there is a big pile of old submarine accumulators with an area of 3,000 square meters. Russian Navy has given $50,000 for utilization. Part of the elements here are carcinogenic. They may cause poisoning, as well as lung cancer and allergy if they come in contact with skin. A great part of them are in water, active surroundings, and fish are poisoned first. This is ecologically the most dangerous place in the port. Okay, um, we have one student from Petersburg who would like to comment on this. Please, Alona. Uh, hi, my name is Alona. I'm from St. Petersburg University. I would like to give a little answer. Uh, Russia uh, is not prepared for receiving our army back and we have neither time nor money to clean territories army leaves. Uh, it doesn't mean that Russian people uh, don't care about these territories and uh, that not 
a pleasant fact for us to understand it, but it is happened due to the economic situations, and it is reality. Thank you. Thank you, Alona. We a short comment from a representative from the Estonian Ministry of Environment. Short Thanks. answer to German side because there was a question concerning uh, what we did. We already investigated and uh, did inventory more than 150 sites and we have a quite good overview about the real pollution there. And we have a certain state budget uh, side uh, about uh, 8 million Estonian kronos for that purpose is uh, 1995. So we are moving and we are working on that line as we can. Thank you. So this is, of course, a very touchy question. Who is going to take care of all this? And I know the situation is not easy for any country. And I'm sure that the Germans can uh, fill up this picture. Um, well, I should co uh, shortly comment on it. If you well, want to. Um, in, hi, I'm Chris. I'm coming from, coming from Lüneburg. I'm studying at the University of Lüneburg. Um, Applied Cultural Sciences. Um, we have made our own experiences with, um, with the army. Near Lüneburg there has been uh, the British forces and uh, they are left their training um, camp too. And, but they will pay the large amount um, of the costs they spend. They will clean up and tidy up the, the places and uh, it will be cost about uh, 30 million marks. I have uh, still a question. What, what are you going to do with your uh, your harbors and your, your coast, uh, will it be possible to, to say to well, um, some sort of industrial companies, um, you get this, these areas for free when you clean it up? Um, this should be a, a possibility to get rid of these places and uh, become money for it. Over here, there is a comment, please. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good idea. Mm. Of course, we also try to use a similar approach. Mm. For example, uh, we have a Silama military, former military plant, and there, that is just uh, under the privatization. And, uh, of course, one idea is to minimize the real cost of that uh, factory and all surrounding there as, as much as possible. And at the same time, of course, uh, to find uh, real solutions to our environmental problems there. But of course, uh, that's not very uh, useful in uh, a lot of cases because usually uh, there is a different uh, approach concerning uh, past pollution and uh, concerning new owners' uh, rights. And that uh, should be regulated by legislation and the different regulations. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a very big and difficult moral question here, which has to do with who is responsible for bad management that was done by an earlier actor of some kind? In this case, of course, uh, the Soviet Union military policy was not environmentally friendly at all, and there are big and what's called environmental debt being developed. And that has developed in many countries, but of course it's a little worse here. Who is going to pay it? We should be very careful to avoid uh, developing some sort of um, collective uh, uh, guilt in this situation. That's dangerous. We should avoid that. We should try to be constructive, as, as a couple of proposals here say. But one interesting question that I would like to ask to our friends from England, since we have two students from England here, is that uh, quite a large share of the uh, uh, precipitation that is uh, eutrophying the Baltic Sea comes from England. And if we apply the polluter spray Principle. What are you going to do in England over there? Um, mm. That's a difficult question, perhaps. Um, I think I would pass it on, perhaps, and say that the pollution, most countries pollute, produce pollution and pass it on to someone else. And I could quote um, perhaps some other instances of Sweden and practices, um, particularly, say, concerning their cars, which apparently I've been told they export to Estonia, the older ones, which pollute more than the new, new ones which are often fitted with catalytic converters. I think if we start bickering about who is responsible and not join up together to answer the problems, 
we would won't answer them, we will just go around in circles. Mm -hmm. Well, with these uh, words from our guest students from uh, England, we'll go back to Germany. Uh, so I think we have to go on with the next, next subject now, Lars. What do you say about that? Lars, can you go on with the next subject? You need to start over here. Well, I think you should start over there. I know you prepared a lot of things about how um, the uh, technology is running in today's societies, and of course, Military technology is one uh, thing, and I know one student here had a very good comment about military technology. Who was this, talking about green militarism? Somebody talked about that. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the students did so. Apparently they have forgotten about it. So, over to uh, Germany, and you uh, could give us some ideas uh, about the German society with today's technology and um, what you think about this. I will introduce myself. My name is Anke Voss and I'm a scientific assistant at the University of Lüneburg at the Department of Economics and I'm working in a research project concerning the waste management in the European community. I'm I try to analyze the legal and um, administrative and um, organizational structure of the waste management in the 12 member states of the European community and to analyze the policy of the European community itself concerning waste. And it's my experience during the two years of the research project that we have to analyze this problems in a broader context that we have to pay attention to, to national, the national specific um, structure, to the legal framework and to the econom economic structure. One example for Germany uh, which shows us how uh, important this is, is the dual system. I will, um, I will uh, explain it in a, in a short way. We, have, um, we try in Germany to avoid waste and to recycle waste and to dump only the waste which cannot be avoided and recycled. And we want to make the producers of packaging waste responsible for the waste and therefore we have divided our um, system of collecting waste. The public institutions collect the waste and a private institution can collect the packaging wage, waste which is um, separated by the households. And these materials we will uh, recycle in Germany. The Germans can collect very accurately, it's, uh, they are very accurate people and uh, they have uh, collected great amounts of, of waste and we have the problems that we have no recycling facilities in Germany and therefore we have to export the waste quantities to another country, for example to countries uh, in the com European community or to Switzerland or to Indonesia. Um, about this example yes. in Indonesia. Perhaps we can tell them very short about this. Yes, in Indonesia it was the problem that we have um, waste collectors, uh, Indonesian people who collect plastic materials at the dump sites and they sell these materials. And now the German waste comes to, to Indonesia and uh, this, um, these quantities destroyed the structure which um, was in Indonesia and the people who, who um, got revenues from the selling of the materials uh, now will, will have no revenues. Mm -hmm. And this uh, shows us with a short example how uh, important it is to, to deal with the problems in a broader context. Thank you very much. Of course, this is a horrifying story. And uh, I'm not sure how waste is handled in Estonia, where we are, but uh, I know that Rein Munter here knows about some of the biggest piles of waste they have in the country. 
Uh, yes, in Estonia, solid wastes have been also a big problem uh, for a long period. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, 1993, about 14.5 uh, million tons of solid waste uh, were generated in Estonia. And 90% uh, from this amount are our oil shale, semi-coke and ash. Uh, and I think uh, uh, there are only two possibilities to solve the problem to export these ash mounds or heaps uh, with average height of about 100 meter to find uh, some country who wants uh, to take them. And uh, the second solution is more realistic, simply to reduce oil shale uh, as a part of our energy balance. Uh, it has been uh, some years ago about 50% if we succeed to reduce it Twice, I think it will happen in the future if we succeed to increase correspondingly the part of natural gas. Uh, in this case, we can more or less solve the problem, but as well as uh, oil shale contains about 60-65% of mineral matter, if we um, carry out the process of semi-coking, uh, these uh, solid wastes are, um, uh, or generation of the solid wastes, it's uh, simply unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So you would say that in some cases you might have technological solutions for this. And of course there is some energy production does not have waste. But uh, what are the technological solutions for the waste in Germany? Do you have that? Do you develop waste incineration or something? I think that in the German society we have a very good high technological uh, end of pipe system. So they called the earlier minister of environment in Germany the end of pipe minister. And now we have a new minister and I think they are going on in the same way. But we want to uh, talk a little about transports now. And you know that transports are very bad for the environment we want to give a very small example out of everyday life. Yes, uh, my name is Katrin. I'm from the University of Lüneburg. And I want to introduce a problem that at first sight might not be connected to the Baltic Sea at all because it's about something that we all know from our daily life. It's about yogurt. And uh, I want to show you on a map here the Wuppertal Institute um, did a survey on all the kilometers that is involved with producing <coughs> and distributing the yogurt. And you see on this map here, this is the place in Stuttgart where the yogurt factory is. And for example, um, the milk and the sugar comes from a very local area. But the fruit, for example, the strawberries for the yogurt, they get all the way from Poland. And parts for the cups, the plastic material comes from France and so on. So you see these big networks of, of roads and travel that this yogurt takes and it takes about 9.2 meters for each little cup of yogurt until it ends up at the consumer, which is quite a lot. So um, we thought all this transport is a little bit unnecessary and we would like to avoid it. And in the end, we would hope that the map, the picture could look like this, that we have a very small producing and distribution network there. And so we try to think about problems, uh, or rather solutions to this problem. <coughs> the idea is how to uh, de uh, decentralize the production. And uh, we actually even came up with a little solution, but first we may want to pass the question on to you here in Blekido or in Tallinn and see uh, if you have any idea how to reduce the transport. Yes, I think we have one small comment on that. Um, yesterday evening, I went through the Lüneburger Stint together with Sigrid from the UNESCO and she was very impressed because we saw many, many bikes parked there. So we think that's one solution for the towns, to go by bike. And I know that the students in Lün Lüneburg, they are doing that. And they have also another system that is very good. 
So I think this is one possibility. Do you go by bike in Tallinn? Well, I don't think I've seen many bikes in Tallinn, I can tell you that. Um, perhaps, Rain, you are known no Tallinn since many years, what you said, you have many bikes in Tallinn. No, we don't have, uh, uh, unfortunately. It, of course, it would be good, uh, yeah. for example, in our campus to, yeah. to have a bike. Yeah. But the main reason why we have so few bikes, I think, uh, we don't have simply special roads yeah. uh, for uh, bicyclists. I think that would be a good investment to build such roads. Well, the word to one of the students. Yes, my name is Jan. I come from the University of Uppsala where there are a lot of bikes anyway. And mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, discuss uh, production a little and uh, uh, environmental uh, policy making. As we know, the, uh, uh, the businessman and the industry's main concern is to optimize and to uh, maximize their uh, uh, profit. And as this is the case, it's very important, I think, that we uh, that we give them uh, economic incentives to uh, to uh, produce in a more uh, environmentally friendly way. And uh, my question is, um, how can and what kind of legislation and uh, what kind of uh, economic uh, instruments could be used to make this to accomplish these purposes as efficient as possible? And also, what problems are uh, related to such regulations from the state. Thank you very much. This is then how, how to uh, introduce efficient measures to get away from these technologies. Do you have a comment in, uh, in Blackhead on this? Yes, some students want to make a comment on that. Yes, my name is Ia and I'm from the Lund University. And in the transportation group, we actually came up with two kinds of solutions. One is for the transportation. We would like heavy taxation on the industrial transport, especially trucks. And the other one is that an introduction of the pop tax, that is progressive output production tax. The more you produce, the more you should pay. And that would stimulate smaller enterprises economically and promote decentralization. So that's our two solutions. That's your own invention in the group? Or? Yeah, yes? our okay. own invention <laughs> of the pop tax. We have another comment too. Yes, I, I can speak for the waste sector. And um, economic instruments are taxes and, um, for example, the, the selling of licenses for pollution. The problem in the waste sector is that we have an emission which is uh, transportable and we can have illegal dumping when if we implement systems with economic instruments for example in um, in ex, uh, taxation system we have the problem that the people can take the waste and and dumping dump it in, in the forest for example uh, we work on on systems uh, which uh, mm, uh, create incentives for for the industry to to use um, integrated system for a cleaner technology, but it's uh, it's a very um, uh, difficult because they have uh, possibilities to avoid these uh, economic um, these taxations. For example, the uh, the problem is is very complex. Okay. But uh, I think we have to try to find this way of local structures we just talked about with this small yogurt example. So we must find other solutions than huge technology. We spoke about uh, large uh, kilometers, amounts of kilometers, and we speak about huge technology. We spoke about uh, uh, some sort of dinosaur technology we are having. And uh, we must go away from that and take some steps in the right direction. So I think some students? Uh, yes, but my question is a little from the past. Uh, my name is uh, Hania. Uh, I'm coming from Agricultural University in Poznan. And 
for uh, for example of course we uh, we should be uh, very careful about the waste uh, which we are making now but also we have many waste from the past and for example in the second world war uh, more than 50,000 of tons of mustard gas sink in the Baltic Sea mm -hmm. and uh, barrels of mustard gas till now they are laying at the bottom uh, they are getting rust uh, and the gas is outflowing so I would like to ask what has been done in this case of in, in the last years In Blackheader, I will just very briefly say before we go on that there is a Helcom committee on the mustard gas, and I think the decision was to let the gas stay where it is before when it goes out into the water, it's being uh, um, it's being uh, reacting with the water, and it's it's not uh, dangerous anymore. So it's only when it comes up in the fisherman's net that it's dangerous. So they decided to let it stay where it is. But uh, this very short technical answer will go over to a few of the students here who actually prepared several of um, the questions about what to do. And I think uh, talking about yogurt, I think Morten has something to comment on this. Yes, uh, um, my name is Morten. I'm from Obo Academy in Finland. And uh, I'd like to ask a such question. Now when we have discussed all kinds of problems, how is it possible for the eastern parts of Europe let's say the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and Russia as well, uh, to avoid the mistakes made when, uh, when economic growth takes place. Uh, I mean, how is it possible to industrialize without the pollution which occur, occurred in the Western countries when they are industrialized? I'd like to ask this question to Germany because they have such a good technology nowadays. Mm -hmm. Thank you, of course, th this is a key question. I know that Germans ask the same thing. I just want to point out that uh, one way is to find new technologies, of course, and we have one of the students from Tallinn Tech here who is uh, uh, thinking about that, please. Uh, my name is Lauri, I'm from Tallinn Technical University. We all know that there are very many wetlands in Estonia, and I want to know, is it possible to use the wetlands as a natural technology to clean the wastewater? Mm -hmm. Well, a short answer from Rein Munter uh, about the wetlands, because you are a specialist in uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not a big specialist in wetlands, but as mm -hmm. much as I know, this is of course a good uh, solution in principle. It's an ecological uh, method. Uh, and has a lot of advantages, like um, uh, different processes of adsorption, filtration by the roots and stems of uh, the water plants. But at the same time, this method has also uh, several disadvantages, like uh, very long residence time, large uh, needed areas, uh, sensitivity to uh, climate conditions. So I think uh, this method um, is quite perspective uh, um, in uh, uh, agricultural areas, but uh, not for uh, wastewater treatment of uh, big cities. Uh, thank you. Well, okay. Uh, so, Osak? I would mm -hmm. like to add only one mm -hmm. phrase that uh, it is good for industry, but very bad for wetlands. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, that uh, will be interesting to see if somebody has to uh, comment on that later on. But first, we'll let Annika here come in. Hmm. Yes, my name is Annika Zumbeck. I come from Åbo Academy University in Finland. I think that a lot has been said about the problems, and especially for the former Eastern countries, I think a main problem is the financial problem. And we have been discussing this in our group, and we think that cooperation is very important. And we discussed uh, a kind of uh, Baltic fund of money, where money could be paid according to the capability of, of the country, and so, and, and then we think that it's very important to, to realize that the money should be used where the result can be the biggest. I mean, not maybe not in the Scandinavian countries all the time, because there it's it's quite good already. And I'd like to pose a question to to the rep representative from the environmental ministry in, in Estonia, if you have 
if you have seen something of this cooperation. Mm -hmm. Before letting the microphone mm -hmm. over to our um, colleague from the Minister of Environment, we'll send it back over the satellite to Germany. And in particular, we would like to know if the European Union is going to invest in uh, the environmental upgrading of the uh, Central and Eastern Europe, of course. Hello, I'm uh, Vivica Vretare from Lund University. And I think it's an excellent idea. I just want to say that that's an idea that we have come up to as well. I think it's really good, and I think we should create a fund like that. That's all I have to say. Yes, we have to do to listen to the young people. This is very important too. Who is actually okay. chairman of the Health Committee, who has designed a, a grand financing operation for the cleanup of the entire Baltic region, and I don't know, do you think this is done in a good cooperation, or is it done mostly through national means, or how is it being handled? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a joint comprehensive program to uh, reduce the pollution of the Baltic Sea, yeah. and uh, in this program there are 132 so-called hot spots. And we needed 18 billions of acres. Yeah. We have a map of the hotspots. Uh, you can see if the people in the, the TV people can show us the map. But uh, continue to yeah. talk, please. It's a very big money. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we are thinking what happens during last mm -hmm. years, not too much. I can inform you that we could dissolve only eight hotspots, four in Sweden and four in Finland and no one in the eastern part of Baltic area. Mm. Lack of money. Mm. Mm. And these eight uh, hotspots, uh, it, it have been uh, uh, pulp and paper mills, reconstructed mm. in a new technology, and unfortunately. What, what was this? Yeah. Was it ozonation instead of chlorination or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah partly it's so. Mm. But uh, in the eastern part uh, of Europe, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to we need uh, support mm, from the mm, Scandinavian countries and, and mm. Germany, but I am not very optimistic about the European community. Mm. We know that they promised much, but not too much money is involved uh, up mm. today in, in the industry in the Eastern. What do Mr. Lee from the <coughs> ministry say? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I welcome uh, such an approach that good cooperation and coordination should be uh, between the countries and we are on that way already. We, we try to coordinate our financial uh, grants or support uh, with our neighboring countries, especially with uh, Scandinavia and also with Germany as well. And uh, that's very important factor in our financial solutions and solving our hotspots and I would like to say that at least the uh, Tallinn wastewater preparation plant is on the way and uh, I hope that uh, if we can follow that financial scheme together with EBRD and other donors uh, around us then uh, I hope that uh, that will be one of our first uh, hotspots what should be deleted in the near future but uh, we, of course, must work on that. I need a good cooperation, of course, uh, to stress. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Werner. Yeah, I'd yeah. like only to add that we, we don't never forget that all the banks are offered only loans, never grants. Mm -hmm. And the loans should be paid back. And who will pay? It's our youngs. So the young generation should pay during the next 10 or 20 years. That we have to remember always. Mm -hmm. Yes, and one again remark on that, that hopefully that is our future, that more and more projects should be covered with different types of loans. Of course, uh, such kind of loans, what is possible to pay back, and that we should work on that and study the questions very carefully. Thank you, of course. The question then would be if the young uh, people here from the western part of the Baltic region would be able to give away the money to the young people from the eastern part of the Baltic region. Are you prepared to do that? <laughs> That's a good question. 
Somebody wants to answer immediately? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good question yeah. of your Lars, and I, I want to say that uh, I am prepared to give some money to environment to live in, because, I mean, if I keep the money for myself, it can also, also happen that there is no environment to live in, so I'm willing to pay something for, for the environment to live in. It's worth if I a want lot, it to mean. exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think w one of the students from Sweden here has something to comment on this. What we want to have in the future? Well, yes, my name is Panila and I come from the Agricultural University of Uppsala. And I think it's very important to recircle all the nutrients in the society. And I think one way of, of doing this is to uh, connect one farm to a society and you have to put the sludge into the fields to recircle uh, the nutrients. And I think it's very important to do this in the future, to make a sustainable development. Thank you. We will now send the word back to Germany. Yes. First of all, we know where the money is. Of course, in the new, new budget in Germany for the next year, the government uh, want to have 48 billion German marks for defense and 15 billion marks for education and 1.4 billion marks for environmental matters. So I think we must speak again about that. We have to find some way to change some fundamental change we have to do. We all know that, but we must do it also. And some students want to say something now. Please. Yes, I'm Christian from the University of Lüneburg. And I think all of you are also ready to um, cooperate with you in the eastern parts of Europe, because without international cooperation, I think we won't be able to survive very long on this, on this, on this planet. And, uh, I think together we must, we must search for another way to attack those problems, for what we call a third way. We must uh, try and combine um, economic growth with um, environmental progress, because um, during the last centuries in Germany, um, the only point that was really important was the um, economic growth and not the environmental side of the medal. So we have to combine these two. Yes, it's a matter of quality, not always a matter of quantity. We shouldn't forget that. A student want to say something? Yes, I, I would like, uh, coming back a little bit to the uh, question about uh, use uh, uh, wetlands as a uh, nitrogen and uh, biogens uh, trap. Uh, I have added something that uh, with net, uh, wetlands is such thing that uh, they are uh, in a special place. But uh, in Poland now is starting a quite big program with uh, developing of use uh, ecotons area as a n uh, nitrogen and phosphorus trap because ecotone is area between uh, two different environments, uh, land one and uh, water one, which consists uh, very rich communities of animals and, and uh, uh, plants. Uh, some from this reason, this is uh, very um, lucrative from nature point of view, let's say, uh, to use this uh, area as a, um, for the cleaning environment. Okay. Yes, we know that we need modern technology, but not always dinosaur technology. Over to Talon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, of course, there are many students here who want to comment on this, and I will just give the word to Eleanor here, who is interested about sustainability, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I believe there must be a shift in the power structure in society. It's very important that we engage people from different groups that are not so active in the politics now. Uh, if you think of women and uh, younger people, often they have, um, they have uh, an engagement in uh, 
environmental things and often women have the responsibility in the homes and I think there is where the recycling society begins in home. Thank you. Thank you. Of course this is a very important interesting question. Who will decide in society and what effect does that have on the environmental policy? Will other groups go in for a different environmental policy? And, and we also uh, have one of the students from Tallinn Technical University who uh, have a similar question, I guess. It's, uh, we'll let the microphone pass back there. Hi, my name is Gnev Vihalm, and I'm from Tallinn Tech. And we had an idea about the size of the factories. Because uh, if the factory size is smaller, mm -hmm. then we don't need a so big like the transportation, like you had the sample about this yogurt factory. So there can be more smaller plants, and transportation will go away, this problem. So that's one idea. Thank you. Of course, um, the right size technology is important. So there are many ideas on how to um, get into a new kind of society here. Uh, however, we will not have time to answer them. We will not be able to answer them, but we will spend our the rest of our lives trying to find the answers, I think. And I will just finish this space bridge over Germany, Estonia, Blackgade and uh, Tallinn with participants from many countries by wishing you all a very peaceful Christmas because Christmas time is approaching and I also would like to uh, ask you welcome back in 1995 and then over to Blackyeda for the last time. Hello, my name is uh, Andrea and I'm a student I'm from the, the University of Lüneburg. I think we have a good time together today and I hope we will meet us next year at the Baltic University again. And all who are sitting here around in Blackyeda wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy, good, happy New Year. Goodbye.